<coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we continue now with three more contributions. Um, by the way, you have seen how our electronic system really works and uh, is successful. We would like, now like to introduce Professor Jose Viriato Zoromeno Marquez. He is a um, um, full professor at the University of Lisbon, where he teaches political philosophy, philosophy of nature, and European ideas in the Department of Philosophy and European Studies. He chairs and is a member of numerous high level councils and networks on environmental and sustainable development issues. He's a member of the Lisbon Academy of Sciences, class of the humanities, and also a member of the Navy Academy. He's a regular media contributor and has written over 400 works and has spoken at many, many conferences worldwide. Welcome and thank you for being here. Professor Frozen Cons, please. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Gunter Stock. I would like also to greet uh, Professor Luis Aires Barros, dear colleagues from ALIA, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm about to speak a little bit, 20 minutes, that's the time I have, so I'm looking for my clock to avoid the red signs, uh, to speak about science policy. So we are the Lisbon Agenda, uh, Europe 2020, Horizon 2020, we are speaking about uh, science policy. And I will try to address two main questions. Why do we need a science policy able to exercise critical reflexivity? And the second one, what are the two key issues deserving more emphasis in the art of our science and research agendas? Finally, I will try to draw some conclusions. <clears throat> I start with a, a reflection from a great European thinker, Ulrich Beck, who died recently. Um, he, he, in my opinion, he was one of the bright minds uh, in drawing a vision about uh, uh, the present condition of our time. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the concept he gave us of reflexive modernity, it's very important to understand the key tasks of science today. So, according to Beck and to my vision of Beck, um, the role of science and science policy as well is to understand the fragility of our societies and to understand how to overcome uh, those fragilities. Um, we are in a, a time that is uh, rare, that is completely different from previous eras, and probably uh, the Dutch chemist and the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Crutzen, uh, used a, a, a very uh, interesting, uh, baptized our time with a very interesting expression, the Anthropocene era. So I think that uh, we, in order to understand the individuality, specificity, specificity of our time, uh, the idea that we live in um, an ontological different time is also very important. As you may see, um, Crutzen identified the past two centuries as an epoch, an era, in which the action of humans is clearly noticeable in the world, in our planet. In that way, I think that uh, uh, science is connected with um, the way in which uh, humankind was able to become so preeminent, so influent in our planet. Uh, science is embedded with modern expectations uh, Francis Bacon, who is the father of the idea of the Academy of Science, uh, not just uh, presented science as a tool for truth discovery, but also as a mechanism, a societal mechanism, able to enlarge the bounds of human empire to the affecting of all things possible. So, science is also driven by a combination of Dr. Faust and also Prometheus. And that's why it's so important the role of academies of sciences. 
because we have many uh, forces driving uh, science which are non-scientific driving forces. Uh, we have uh, uh, financing constraints, we have personal narratives and expectations, vested interests, political agendas, and uh, as you know by your own experience, professional experience, we are many times asked to provide technical operational solutions. That's why we need discipline, we need uh, criticism, we need to be very, um, uh, very demanding to ourselves and to our work. And indeed, uh, modern science is a negative conquest, as uh, we may define. Um, and uh, scientists many times um, tend to promise uh, things that they are not, uh, they are not able to provide. Uh, Professor Snow, in the very known conference Two Cultures, um, uh, presented the idea that by the, thousand, two, by the year 2000, we, as hum humankind, would have overcome poverty. That's not the case. So, we need to fight against a kind of scientific uh, schwärmerei tendency. So, a, a tendency to go uh, beyond the limits of science. And uh, we have <laughs> an ideology of technoscience, the ideo ideology that uh, we can fix all the problems with technology. E e and uh, it goes on, uh, probably you, you can see the, the cartoon, but the, the guy over is telling to the, the person that is uh, in the habits, don't worry, technology will save you. That's why uh, uh, we live indeed like back road in a risk society, and we live also in a very um, uh, in a, a, a Europe, 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 European situation that is prone to several risks. And um, uh, in that sense, I think that we may identify a kind of pattern. Um, we have more technological power than political wisdom. We tend to ab abide by linear causal planning. Sometimes we are hurt by arrogance of the will and poor, poor scientific understanding of complexity, and we tend to give priority to short-term instead of long-term long strategic vision. That's why we need a science policy to tackle with, those, with these problems. Well, I also am quoting Professor Mariano Gago, uh, the late uh, Minister of Science uh, in Portugal, um, a great scientist, he, he was also the responsible for the preparation of the scientific and technology dimensions of the Lisbon Agenda, and uh, he was aware that science, in, in this sense he is in the line of Beck, uh, science has to take care of risk governance. As he wrote, in addressing major public risks issues, science can reaffirm its role as a trusted partner of society and does, uh, and does enlarge its constituency. Multidisciplinarity is imperative. The social sciences and humanities have to be combined with engineering and the natural sciences to develop useful de decision-making tools. To conclude uh, this topic, uh, I will identify what we may say like the tasks for an European science policy. First, not compromising with mythological fancies about science. Being able to contribute for problem-solving solutions in the line of the definition that Thomas S. Kuhn uh, gave to science. To understand its own political habitat as part of its nature and task. The scientific endeavor is connected with the policy and the, poli and the society in which it is uh, produced. And we need to face the Bertrand Russell riddle, uh, can a scientific society, society be stable? That's the title of a, a magnific, uh, very wise paper you wrote in 1949. Going to my second topic, wh what are the two key issues deserving more emphasis in the art of our science and research agenda? 
Let, let me remind you again about uh, the Lisbon Agenda. In the Lisbon Agenda, there was a, a certain vision, a certain vision of Europe and of the future of Europe and, and, and the world. Uh, the famous quote uh, from the conclusion of the Lisbon European Council of March 2000. The idea was to transform the European Union in 2010 into the most competitive and knowledge-based economy in the world capable of sustainable economic growth with more and better jobs and greater, greater, greater social cohesion. This is the three stars of sustainable development were there. And uh, if we look now to Horizon 2020, uh, Graça Carvalho already described uh, the very <coughs> important work that was done. And I, I would like to, to say that my perspective is not to identify a list of pros and cons, but to go another way in the sense that we need to put emphasis in topics that we can see in the Horizon 2020 framework program. However, probably they should be more, put more in, in, in relevance. And I will try to, to, to present you my vision of that. Um, the Lisbon Agenda was not only important for Euro Europeans, but it was a message sent to the world. I am uh, quoting an American schooler, Professor Kupchen, uh, from Georgetown, uh, who was very enthusiastic about the progress Europe was ma making in 2000, in the first years of this century. Uh, and he wrote, the integration of Europe is one of the most significant geopolitical events of the 20th century. It represents a turning point every bit as momentous as the founding of the United States as a federal union. Perhaps more so, Europe has taken history in its hands and is sculpting its own landscape. <clears throat> after, after centuries, sorry, no. Okay. After centuries of rivalry and bloodshed uh, among competing Poles, the Europeans have had enough. They are in the midst of a revolutionary process of geopolitical engineering aimed at merging these competing polities into a collective whole, eliminating once and for all war among Europe's national states. Well, I must confess that I met in 2011 Professor Kupchen in a conference and I asked, do you think the same? And he answered me, I was right about the United States. Because the book was about the decline of the United States. So, we live in different times. Uh, Europe is amidst a deep crisis. And uh, I think that science uh, needs to tackle the, the, the shift dimensions of that crisis. That's why I am quoting um, Professor, uh, uh, President Roosevelt and uh, 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 President uh, Anot, uh, Anot Tong from the Kiribati Republic in two different uh, uh, time landscapes. The first quote is uh, the inaugural address of Roosevelt um, in the process of the Great Depression started in 2000, uh, uh, 1929. And um, uh, Anot Tong uh, uh, he, he spoke uh, about uh, climate change and the danger uh, for Kiribati Republic uh, deriving from that. And I think that those tasks are precisely the two issues that we may find in the Horizon 2020, but we, that we need to put more emphasis on that. It's not a matter of put, putting more money, it's a, a matter of pu putting more intellectual, moral, political emphasis on that. And I will address very quickly the two points. So the first is the need to study as a scientific topic the European Union, the Mo European Monetary Union and uh, the political landscape for that. Why are we in crisis at that, that field? And the second topic is about environmental crisis and climate change. Very quickly, the clock is, is ticking. Um, we tend 
to speak about the crisis as an issue of several of some countries, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus, Spain, but indeed, as um, Wolfgang Munchau wrote, we are speaking about uh, structural problems of our MU, in the European Monetary Union. We are, we are speaking about, using uh, the words of Munchau, utterly dysfunctional policy regime that has proved economically illiterate and politically unsustainable. And indeed, we can find social cohesion in the current situation of Europe. Uh, in 2014, nine countries, Estonia, Ireland, Greece, Spain, Cyprus, Malta, Portugal, Slovenia, and Slovakia, although having just 25% of the Eurozone population at 50% of the total AZ unemployment. So this is a very unbalanced um, monetary union. And uh, uh, theoretically speaking, we gave uh, to the crisis uh, the wrong diagnosis. We call it uh, sovereign debt crisis, but indeed it's a, it's a, a, a finance system crisis. As you may see uh, in the table I'm showing you, uh, just after the negative impact of the financial crisis over the bank system in, in Europe, we see the jumping line of the sovereign debt uh, in EU and the AZ countries. All countries increased sharply and strongly the debt in order to save uh, their uh, uh, finance systems. Um, well, and the result is not uh, very fair. <coughs> That's why we need uh, uh, the courage to do the structural reform we need. We need structural reform both in countries but also at European level. And uh, I'm quoting Stiglitz, he, he said that precisely. We need to uh, reform the EU uh, uh, monetary union and to, and to tackle the issue as a scientific issue. It's not a politics issue, it's a, a scientific issue. Um, Oh, this is memory, <laughs> very important memory. 1977, as, uh, a scientific group uh, was called by the commission of those days, the McDougall Commission, and they, uh, they draw a very important study about the future of, of public finances in the European Union uh, that was about to come. And uh, the, the main conclusions um, advise not to create any currency union without a shift uh, finance reform. We need at least 5 to 7 percent of, of a common budget in order to enforce a working European monetary union. And you know, the budget of the union in 1977 was zero. 0.7% of the GDP of the Euro, of Euro, European GDP. And do you know what, what, what is our current European Union budget? 1%. So this is a low cost uh, monetary union. And it, that's not a good sign. Um, well, going to my last part uh, of, of my presentation, we have uh, also a long term ontological threat, environmental crisis climate change. And uh, I think that we need at the European level to do what some countries are already doing. Germany, Denmark and also Portugal are putting climate change at the, at, at, as a cross-cutting task in order to provide a new type of economic production. Uh, we don't <coughs> need jobs and growth. If we don't tackle jobs and growth with the ontological threat of climate change. The last report of the IPCC is very strong and uh, if we don't want uh, in 80 years time to have uh, uh, Lisbon uh, with the climate of uh, uh, Tunisia or uh, Berlin with the climate of central Spain, 
we need to do something very sharply and very quickly. Going to my conclusions uh, and uh, nearing the, my time limit, this is also an issue for us as members of academies. We need uh, to introduce a shift in our academic culture. Uh, we need to promote dialogue between the several classes, the, the, the several, several disciplines. And I must confess that regarding the second challenge of environmental and sustainability, uh, the humanities and social science, sciences has a lot to do in order to cope with the challenge of uh, our time. And um, we need to have a prudential approach. Uh, we need a speech for science that is humble um, and uh, that understands that we, we are in a, 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 um, in a kind of a, a race between our imaginative capacity and the tasks, in, in gigantic tasks we have to face. That's why I find, uh, this is my, my uh, uh, second to the last uh, uh, slide, I find this expression from Professor Schellnuber, um, a leading uh, German scientist of climate scientists, uh, very interesting. Uh, the idea that we need uh, a back to earth science and we need also a back to earth policy in science. To conclude, we need more science in politics but also more science policy regarding the strategic planning in research and development. We need less political arrogance and more scientific humility. We need more democratic, active and enlightened citizenship. We need more goal-oriented cooperation within EU countries and at broader international level. Above all, I think that we need to understand that both the reform of the European Union and uh, its uh, uh, monetary union and uh, the greater challenge of overcoming uh, the environmental crisis and the climate crisis are tasks, tasks that any country in Europe is able to perform alone. So I'm very proud to be here in this uh, academy with uh, 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 European uh, fellow uh, members of academies from all Europe because this is a task that gives a reason for Europe and the European Union to go on and to live and to be able to overcome its own, de its own devils. Thank you very much.